they'll talk to you as though they've always, you know, you've been around and as though, you know, they'll use terms like, I mean, this is laughable, you know, the whole flying spaghetti monster nonsense, you know, the idea that one could ever reconcile Christianity to Islam is not true. You are or you are not a Christian uh, based upon one thing, and it is this. What do you believe about the person and nature of Jesus That's Christ? Uh, they don't have to come up against a person like Jordan Peterson and kind of prove their mettle by assassinating the character of the man. Or, you know, or say that his arguments are juvenile or any of the boring, vapid, nonsensical, you know, trite and saccharine so-called arguments that you put up against them that are... That Opponents of Christians, you people are always trying to muzzle us and always trying to shut us down. It's not hate-mongering if somebody disagrees with a sliver of the tenets that you conduct your own lifestyle in. You're the hate-monger for trying to shut us up, and it won't ever happen. Not on the watch of true believers. It just won't. We don't view this culture as anything but the cesspool that it's always been. From, uh, from the Babylonian days till now. We sit around and we shake our fist at God, the very fist that he allows you to have, that you then shake at him. Like the Ten Commandments covers it all, okay? Uh, yeah, but that's coming from I am the Lord, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, we hold up ourselves as like this bastion of like free thought and human evolution like we are every bit as murderous and treacherous and disgusting and depraved and selfish as we ever were if not more dispense with your delusions of morality it doesn't exist you're not moral i'm not moral Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. <laughs> and return <laughs> returning with me is Richie English. You guys probably might have seen him. Was on, you were here a couple months ago. Yes, I was. This was like a good four or five months. Mm -hmm. This is when I first started the channel, actually. This is one of the first videos I did. And we were talking about, you know, our just Christianity, life, all that. <laughs> All kinds of Theism, things. Theism, atheism. I think we were getting into like scholarship too. Oh yeah, I uh, format something. But there's a point yeah. where the answers stop. Because what god is it that is worth worshiping if you can apprehend him? And people will say, "Well, that's a cop out." Shut up! It's not a cop. <laughs> I'm not, I've heard it all my life, and I've had to keep silent. It's always the Christians now. Like it's okay to be intolerant of intolerance, you bastards. Okay, you had just a. <laughs> A little bit of a vendetta to um, yeah process out of myself. Yeah, you had at some the time to say about uh about some you know you know the academic cesspool. <laughs> yeah, how they're very critical of of your faith, in which I can understand that. Yeah, they're the avowed enemy of Christianity. <laughs> they really are. They're the dragon. The there got there's got to be a prophecy somewhere between Daniel and Revelation, <laughs> uh, like about academia. Right. I I haven't worked that out yet, but uh, I don't know. It's like I'm I'm very grateful. There's a lot of stuff about the scribes. Be careful. Beware of the scribes. There you go. My pastor used to always say, "The sc and scribe means scholar." That's how this is the type of person he was. He would look for little things that like play off of and that's how but if you gave me an ak-47 right now with enough ammo to take all of you out and before i did it i started blaspheming the holy ghost's name and then took you out and then put the gun in my mouth i still end up in heaven and that's how he was nuts man yeah that was nuts i'd like to shake that man's hand for that little bit of wisdom though because it's <laughs> true I, mean, I knew like, you'd like that i knew you'd like that. i do 
Uh, cause I'm, yeah, I'm just going to say it like at this point it's become, uh, an arena of borderline evil in some cases. I mean, you want to talk about a place that like suppresses any kind of free thought, look no further than, uh, you think so? The beating black heart of academia. Oh, I know so. I think with biblical scholarship, though, I think it's, I think they're at least, I think you get some good scholars that are at least favor towards Christianity. They take it seriously, at least, I should say. They're not just throwing everything out. They're at least looking at the facts and saying, let's see what's true and what's not true. Okay, for example, mainstream Christianity or mainstream biblical scholars say Jesus lived and was a real person. He's not a myth. So you have that in your like I don't know. There's some things I, if I was a Christian, I would I would like about academia. But I get what you're saying though. I'm not saying anything wrong. Neil, I'm really happy to be here with you Good though. You I back. love this guy. I'm so proud of him. What is it? Ten point four thousand subscribers right just now. Hit that. Yep. It was at maybe a thousand when I was here last time. I also want to thank um, all of the people that watched the last podcast I I was on because I was vehement yeah and you were all very gracious to me yeah, unexpectedly they, nice. they liked you they, like, that's, they did they, well they, i like you too and i want to do something right now uh like i don't know what you're all going to think about it but whatever in the name of jesus christ thank you lord for letting me be here today and please let this be a wonderful conversation and bless each and every person watching right now whether they believe or not in jesus name amen amen well, there we go. I appreciate that. I appreciate <laughs> that. See, I, I, I'm a, a lot of atheists. They'll they'll say they they don't like they don't appreciate being preyed on or being like when someone says I'll pray for you, they, they take that as like a you know they, you don't have to appreciate they take that it as an insult. I think I, I what a charmed it. life you lead if you take that as an insult. Oh, a lot of people do honestly. Like if someone if one of their loved ones is in the hospital or something, they'll say, oh, you know, you're in my prayers, and they'll say, oh, you know, fuck that, like, you know. That's not going to help me. That doesn't. So it's like me. I'm not, I'm not speaking for all atheists. There's just, you know, there's just a few out there. But I think a lot of people could, would agree with me. It's like I take that as a, uh, a sign of you care. Yeah. Well, I think most sane human beings understand that uh, a, the act of a person sincerely saying and not in this thoughts and prayers. Yeah. Uh, paradigm. A person walking up and saying, what can I pray for you about? Is right. I, wh whether you believe or not. Um, well, it's saying you're basically saying to the person, "I really care, and I, you're, I, you're, it's on my mind enough that I, I'm hoping that something goes right." I'm going to appeal to the living God, yeah. uh, and and you know, take your case before Him. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you I, know, I, like I see that... past the theological implications of that into the humanity of it. Absolutely. But I, I too have really not like, I, I don't want to sit here demonizing, you know, all atheists because it, you know, you, you've got lunatic Christians too. Yeah. And you've got lunatic atheists. You've got lunatics in every, uh, you field do. You and, really and profession, uh, and every philosophy. Uh, so, it, it, you know, I just want to kind of make that clear. That right is now. very true. I, I came out guns blazing last time and, well, there might be some guns to blaze this evening, but uh, I was genuinely shocked by how magnanimous uh, and just outright gracious uh, that y'all were. So thank you very much again like uh, for having me on, Neil, and uh, anybody who's viewing this right now. It was fun, and this is going to be even better. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of where we can start off. Okay, so... You were mentioning that you know you got crazy people on both sides, mm -hmm. and I noticed that there are very you're very right. There are very dogmatic atheists that exist. The thing about atheism, though, is that it's not exactly a, a, a religion. Well, people like to say that atheists equal this. It's not like a Republican equals this or a, a Christian equals it. Atheism it's is a spectrum. Yeah, there's a spectrum of atheists that can go from all different types of worlds walks types of people, types of psychology, types of mentality. But you do get you do get a lot of atheists who are just like, I hate Christians. I hate Muslims. We need to deconvert everybody. We need to get out in the street. And they it's like they're evangelists on the other side. And yeah. they're they're gig they go out and actually want to convert people. I don't want to convert anybody to anything. 
I want to have a conversation with you. You can change my mind. Let's, I'm open. If I can, but I'm not even trying to change your mind. I'm just trying to be honest and open and have a discussion with people. That's literally my entire goal. And there's no like goal of trying to win, trying to debate people. I literally don't care about none of that. Especially if it's someone, if it's making someone's life better and it gives them purpose and meaning and drive. I support that. Yes. Uh, well, there are people that are essentially missionaries for the howling void out there, <laughs> you know? Uh, I like that. But I take a different tack for this. Uh, well, you, you think so? Mm -hmm. The way you, the way you describe things, you're always, you, you always have good ways of like, the Howling Void, like it's, it's like some. Stephen I read King. a lot of H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, that'll be, uh, you know the great good. old ones and the uh, um, the Necronomicon and all that. All my H.P. Lovecraft fans out there, you know oh, what I'm talking about, dude. Robert Price, who I've had on like 20 times. I watched that, by he, the way. He inherited the H.P. Lovecraft universe, and he wrote a bunch of like he was like ahead of the uh, like the whole like fan base for that for a while. Yeah, it's uh um. The Lovecraftian world is yeah. uh, expansive now, and it's influenced like most of the literature that people are reading these days, uh, who aren't even aware of the influence. It's 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 called cosmic horror. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly, H.P. Lovecraft himself, uh, who spent an entire lifetime writing about uh, old gods. Yeah. Uh, the great old ones and, and basically beings that are so uh, vast and enormous that they're incomprehensible and, and just the sight of them or the proximity to them will drive uh, that individual insane. Right now there, that man was an avowed atheist, which I find fascinating. I don't know how much of an atheist like it's he, interesting isn't it he yeah because why would your obsession be writing about in the incomprehensibility of these you know beings and, and for anybody that says that that's well, arbitrary that's, that's how that's it's how, not arbitrary like it must mean something yeah. and he had a very difficult life you know he battled like severe depression um he stayed very localized i just find it very interesting that as an artist his obsession happened to be uh, a cosmic um, pantheon of incomprehensible gods in the same way uh, John Lennon who wrote basically the atheist's manifesto in the song Imagine uh, Imagine there's no heaven it's easy if you try no hell below us above us only sky he also wrote a song called God where he opens up with God is the concept by which we measure our pain the very last song that John Lennon wrote was called You Saved My Soul <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah, and uh, because God was something uh, for these men that rather than being able to ignore him, they had to constantly wrestle with uh, his existence. Like, like for John Lennon, especially, it was a real battle. And watching a, a person like John Lennon, who was a living diary entry, uh, you know, of the human condition, go through that process uh, is just for me as an artist, it's very beautiful. And most of my favorite authors are, you know, b believe things that are antithetical to everything that I stand for. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Lord speaks to me and to everyone through the mouths and through the pens and the voices of people uh, who he's attuned our ears to hear. And in that in my case, certainly, it's uh, people that are really wrestling with something. Uh, people that are going through what I like to call a dichotomous struggle. Uh, you know, the struggle between two binary states, a black and a white, if you like. You know, the existence of God or the existence of him. John Lennon just could not escape it. It's everywhere in his work. H.P. Lovecraft made it his uh, entire literary career to write about uh, a race of incomprehensible, unfathomable cosmic beings, and yet declared himself, you know, an avowed atheist, which I just find fascinating. Well, uh, look at me. I mean, I can identify with all of what you just said. Well, this you is, are the seeker. I, this is all I do. I, when, I'm not, when I'm not recording, I'm reading, or I'm, I'm researching, or I'm, or I'm at work. That's it. It's one of the three things. I'm either 
I'm either working the day job so I can pay all this stuff and pay the bills and make keep making contact. And by the way, all my patrons, thank you because hopefully I can get to a point where I don't have to have that job. I can just keep making. I don't think that it's going to be an issue much longer for you. Hopefully. Do you realize that your channel has grown? What I it started out at uh, a thousand when I uh, first appeared here, and that was last, just yeah. Last time and here, so it's grown nine hundred percent. Yes. Yep. Now, well, well, you need to be proud. I am. Oh no, I'm so proud. No, I'm very happy about where I'm at. I, I, I hope, and I have to. That's what I say. I have to thank the people that watch. I really do, because if no one's watching, I'm not doing it. That's yeah, I, and it's and you've got like a dedicated oh, fan yeah, base that I'm, like engages with you. I mean, like I got to watch. I have 1,100 people that have the bell on right now. <laughs> YouTube uh, analytics has that. They t that that's actual data that they have. 1,100 people that have the bell on. If you're one of those people, I fucking love you. That's all I gotta say. I <laughs> fucking love you. You have a notification for my videos. I fucking love you. Yeah, just wait till it's 10,000 people with the bell. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's but awesome. But anyways, what I was saying was, I. This is all I do. This is all I do. Is I'm digging for the truth. I'm digging for. I'm. I'm. Re I want to know about why we believe what we believe. And uh, you may. You were talking about John Lennon. Th and think about this one line: "God is a concept by which we measure our pain." By which we measure our pain, exactly. And that. And that. It's. It's good to hear the whole sentence. But even just those first couple sentence, first couple words, "God is a concept." Well, think about that. That's I a very elusive. Yeah. Uh, stanza of that verse. I've so John Lennon. I mean, like many people, you know, basically everybody loves John Lennon. Like when I, a, as a musician and a composer, when I first heard John Lennon's solo song, so after the Beatles, my mind really, like I kind of encountered him and David Bowie at the same time. And uh, it rocked me. And so I got his first album. Plastic Ono Band, which the, which the song is on, the yes. song God, yes. and Plastic Ono Band is, is is a record that I I listen to it once a year. I listen to it by myself, not on a drive, not as some you know extraneous background uh, thing. Um, but I listen to John Lennon's Plastic Ono Band record um, in a room by myself. And part of the reason that I do that is because uh, it's so harrowing. I mean, like the, the the songs on that record. He's got another song on that record uh, called Mother. Oh, Mother, crazy. you had me, but I never had you. I wanted you, but you didn't want me. So I, I just got to tell you goodbye, goodbye. And then, he, Deep. He, yeah, and, but it's it's like it's uncomfortable to listen to. Yeah. But it's important. It's like it's like somebody just walks up to you and smacks you right in the mouth and then like walks out the door. And I can only listen to it once a year because it's that powerful of an experience for me. But when I heard the song God, especially, it, it deeply offended me. And I think it's healthy, especially for artists, to encounter things that offend them because then they can ask themselves, why is this offending me? And then if you dig deep into that, you can discover your own unique set of principles absolutely Be and you can't do that if you're c avoiding everything that offends you or anything that offends you it it's you learn more about yourself as a human being by encountering things that you would that raise your hackles this, than you do this is a big concept in gnosticism but not only gnosticism Jungian psychology oh Jungian so Jung psych Jungian psychology I, you might as well I think it's modern Gnosticism because it is it, it, the, it's a, the it's, Jungian archetypes yeah the shadow it, self it, that's what you just said is the is called what Jung calls the integration of the shadow so the shadow is everything you hate everything you hate about the world let's say you're a liberal you hate Republicans whatever it could be any dual opposite but when you integrate your shadow what you're doing is is you're accepting that side so, for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, Young got criticized for being a Nazi sympathizer because he wasn't on the front lines. I mean, he was alive right around the end of World War II, and he was already a known person at this time in the public sphere. Or no, this, I'm a little bit after, but still, there was it was still close enough to World War II where Nazis were still being talked about, and there was still a thing. Like mm -hmm. this is like talking about uh, the Taliban after 9-11 like it's just still fresh kind of long story short he was criticized for being a uh, nazi sympathizer 
because he wasn't criticizing the Nazis. He wasn't, why is this guy always, but he had this sort of weird, he, think about it like this. Young never criticized anything. Think about it. Think about one thing that Carl Young was out there saying, we need to stop this. We, if you look at the, Carl Young's, all of his writings, all of his works, you never see him doing anything like that. Because he was the type of person who was such an analytical mind. He was such a, he was so focused on trying to understand mindsets and different types of people and different archetypes. He was like National Geographic cameraman. Just, you don't interfere with, you know, what you're seeing. You allow it to play out. That's, yeah. That's and, essentially what he was he, he, cognitively. He's so, he was such a deep person that he even understood a Nazi mindset, which I, even me saying that, I, I sound like a Nazi sympathizer saying that. No, Fuck. you don't. No, people need to, like, get a grip with this. I'm glad you brought this up because I was going to bring uh, this up at some point. The, besides music, the one thing that I uh, know quite a bit about, like, it's just always fascinated me, is World War II history. And I've read cover to cover uh, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich uh, at le probably about ten times. Crazy. And it's just one of the greatest, most harrowing stories ever told. The people need to get a grip about this. We need to stop with the Hitler comparisons to everything that somebody doesn't like. Right. We need to stop say, you know, with, you know, accusing people of, uh, you know, being n Nazis. Frankly, like Nazism is different Less entirely than fascism whether you're or white supremacy. Like Nazi is a uh, Nazism is a uniquely Germanic. Well, this is the thing. Aryan, it's turned into this. It's turned into this thing where you you don't like something. It's a Nazi. Or it's yeah, Hitler. it's it, it's the also. It, it doesn't even it's matter. An ad hominem. Yes, that's what it is now. Oh, and they also there's some. This has become so disgustingly prevalent now because you people that are doing this are cheapening the horror that Adolf Hitler perpetrated by just assigning Hitlerism to every single thing that you don't like right uh but w we need to understand as a culture that uh it's gotten so pervasive with this bs that there's now something called a reductio ad hitlerium argument it basically means you've reduced an argument uh by saying oh well you're a nazi like automatically it's the same as an ad hominem attack the moment that you call a person a name in a debate you've lost right so, too, the moment you start assigning uh, arbitrary uh, titles of uh, Nazism or, to a lesser extent, fascism, because fascism, most of the people that use these words have no idea what they even mean. They've got certainly no idea about the history. They couldn't tell you, you know, for instance, that uh, Benito Mussolini was a fascist. They couldn't tell you what his government entails or when it came up. They right. certainly can't tell you what Hitler believed and why. And he was very, very clear about it in Mein Kampf, My Struggle. Uh, his autobiography that he wrote in prison, which you can't, uh, I mean, you're put on like an FBI list now, if you even like look <laughs> that up, how are we going to avoid these things if we can't expose ourselves to them? Like, it's one. so, it's so important. Like Hitler delineated exactly what he was going to do and why. It's just that nobody believed him. And he did. He then procedurally went about it. We need Lebensraum, a uh, li living space. So we're going to, we got to look eastward. Uh, Russia, of course, is to the east of Germany, uh, which precipitated Operation Barbarossa in uh, 1942. And, uh, you know, we also, as a culture, I, I heard a disturbing statistic uh, yesterday, in fact, 50% of uh, teenage Americans now don't know what the Holocaust is. Really? 50%. That's interesting. It's an obscenity. Yeah. And we, so, and even more people have no idea that he didn't just go after uh, the Jews. He went after the Christians uh, he went after trade unionists, he went after the communists, he went after the Jews, and he slaughtered over 20 million Russians alone. Wow. The Russians took the brunt of uh, the, 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 the Nazi atrocities. Yeah. Um, it's just that, you know, we know from history that, uh, Russia is not a place that you, you, you want to be, you don't poke the bear. Once you, once you know, time. once you poke the bear, the bear rolls over you, which is exactly yeah. what happened. It, like it happened in Napoleon, of course, yeah. you know, famously. And, uh, but you know, I am not going to shy away from using Hitler's name or talking about the history or saying, uh, you know, for uh, 
if, if you're going to go that far, you you shouldn't uh, ever drive a Volkswagen uh, for because the Hitler designed the Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah, you should. Uh, you like he was a vegetarian. Uh, he loved dogs as well. I mean, like, you see how absurd this gets. Yeah, he like the great tragedy of uh, Hitler, or one of them certainly, is that uh, you had a person uh, who had an immense uh, set of opportunities to improve his country, and instead turned to the worst kind of human butchery and depravity that one could possibly imagine. And it's like it's tragic for everyone uh, in the world. Their after effects will never stop being felt. Uh, it, it's we all know how unspeakable it was. Well, apparently we don't all know because fifty percent of the generation coming up now doesn't understand this. It's not, I don't even think it's their fault. It's the fault of people censoring this kind of information from developing minds because they're deciding for a supposedly free culture that we live in uh what they can and can't be exposed to and so consequently you now have a bunch of uh kids and teenagers coming up who don't even know that this madman this bastion of pure evil slaughtered genocidally well over uh certainly six million jews and 20 million Russians butchered uh, the Christians first because he couldn't have competition. These things run the risk of happening again. They don't run the risk. They're going to happen again somewhere if people don't understand the warning signs and people start flippantly using the name of Hitler and Nazism to, to, and assigning it to people they don't like. It, it like it's different yeah. and people need to have some respect for the victims of these butchers uh by not being so flippant about w using the, the name of nazism using the name of hitler like you know you can't even that symbol that the hindus used to own the sun wheel yeah, that symbol became it's, the Nazi symbol. It's the most ancient symbol besides the concentric circle, by the way, that we have. It appears it in all kinds of cultures. Egypt, uh, Native American ironic, cultures. Yeah, ironically, it's a symbol of like peace and love and God and all this. And he used that symbol on the flag, and that, that killed that symbol. That symbol's... However, it isn't the people in Tibet still use it. They don't care. They're just ignoring it. It's our symbol. We don't care. What, there's this tilt in a different angle, but I think it's interesting that that symbol becomes a symbol of hate. When all it takes is one person to change an identity of something and make something mean something on its head, flipped, flipped on its head. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, Hitler designed the flag uh, of, uh, you know, for Nazism. He he went so far. Uh, he so uh, for, for people that, you know, don't know too much about this, I won't belabor it, but it is fascinating uh, well, the there was the German Standard Army, which was uh, called the Wehrmacht, and then there was essentially the true believers. I mean, a Nazi is a Nazi, right? But 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 the the the, the latter uh, that I'm referencing it was called the SS, the Schutzstaffel, and for them it, it was rather like the mafia. You you yeah. you had to trace your bloodline back to pure Aryanism. There was an occultic ceremony that we have footage of. Uh, the, the he, um, they were Hitler's personal bodyguard. They started out that way. They evolved from the brown shirts, which was like Hitler's terrorist, uh, street thug organization. And from there, they were taken over by a man named Heinrich Himmler, and he turned them into a highly organized combat arm. And split it into twelve different combat divisions. That name just sounds like Heinrich Himmler. Heinrich Himmler. He was a chicken farmer. Wow. And he wound up, you know, the second worst butcher uh, that 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 there was, uh, because he he ran the SS, and, and the SS, in large part, were responsible for all of the atrocities that we hear about the 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 various massacres of um, armies and civilians, men, women, and children, entire races, and. Hitler designed the uniforms of the SS and he used as their insignia the death's head, the skull and crossbones. And you were also going into battle uh, with people that were prescribed a drug called Preludin, which was speed. It was amphetamine salt. Oh, yeah, I read about this. So too. you were fighting, if you were fighting an SS division, you were going into combat against hopped up genocidal 
maniacs. Right. I mean, and we think we have it so bad in our culture with this COVID thing and, <laughs> and, and, and everything. Imagine living for a moment in 1944 when it was a close call. When you had this man, uh, you know, who is like slaughtering France is getting people. Invaded. Yeah, well, France was the one of the first to yeah. uh, g go, yeah. and uh, and then the Allies invaded France, of course, in June 6, nineteen forty four. Right. Uh, but what's crazy about France being invaded is that France is literally like the brother or sister, however you want to look at it, to America. Like they got had their revolution at the same time as us, pretty much in the same century. And they, they stood for, like, libertarianism, liberalism, freedom of speech, constitutional republics. Everything Hitler hated. And then all of a sudden, yeah, so now we're seeing this country that we grew up with get invaded by Nazi fascists. Well, he did that, though, uh, be, um, in large part because uh, Hitler was a – and this is another thing that uh, you, 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 you can't say without running a risk. I don't care. Uh, I don't. Um, Hitler was a decorated – uh war veteran in world war one he was a corporal uh he was austrian uh twice decorated and he bought into a myth uh, that we know as the stab in the back myth which is basically the german leadership in world war one uh surrendered too soon and they were and then he got it in his head that it was controlled by uh jews there was a long-standing wow. hatred of judaism and uh, in, in, in Germany, uh, you know, it doesn't start with Hitler. It starts all the way back to, with, the, which to like the, Martin Luther. Yeah. And the ghettos, my man. favorite composer, you know, uh, Richard Wagner, the great opera composer, the man who wrote Ride of the Valkyries, uh, you know, uh, just just a, a genius uh, mind, very problematic person. He was one of Hitler's heroes, too. Mm -hmm. Now, that's very but so was Beethoven. You know, like it, it's Jew. Just, Beethoven was a Jew, right? No, Beethoven wasn't a Jew. But which one was the Jewish one? Uh, Mozart? No. Mm -mm. Some one of those guys were. I can't remember who. There was a, a. I mean, there are a lot of myths floating around about you know was Hitler Jewish or? He, oh yeah. He wasn't. <laughs> but uh, but Hitler subscribed to this myth about you know the the German army being betrayed. The hatred festered in him. He was uh, poor and homeless when he got back from the war, but he discovered that he had a tremendous public speaking gift. And uh, he started using that, you know, speaking in front of uh, disgruntled workers and party members. Germany was heavily penalized uh, in the Treaty of Versailles after World War I. Everything was essentially blamed on uh, the country of Germany to, like, to, to a pretty unfair degree. Now, granted, right. they did perpetrate the war, but it, it, it got ridiculous. And the reparations they had to pay bankrupted everybody. The unemployment rate in Germany was, was, was a staggering. Nobody had jobs. The country was crippled. They were humiliated. Right. Germany is a very proud, uh, it has a very, you know, a lot of nationalist pride uh, right. throughout European history. And the League of Nations pretty much put them. Oh, like, God. They, they, hey, they, you dog, get down. Yeah, like, sit. Exactly. Like, it humiliated them. Yeah, yeah. And so and France had a lot to do with this. Like France went overboard with this. And Hitler you, just had this murderous spirit begin to fester and then rot inside of him. But he also it was the perfect storm because that level of hatred and invective and poison was fused with an, an unfortunately boundless energy right. and a relentlessness. And they just started like a hurricane kind of cycling around each other. And what happened was he finally stood up and said, I'm not going to, we're, we're not doing this anymore. We're not paying them. We're going to rebuild our army. He had an uncanny satanic <laughs> gift for being able to read people like a poker player. And he just kind of knew like who, who was bluff and bluster and who meant business. And he, they had the best scientists. Oh, in easily, the world. Like easily. The Einstein uh, escaped from yeah. Germany and, and it's a good thing uh, that he did obviously. Great thing. Yeah. Because uh, you know, imagine the atomic bomb in the hands of a uh, dedicated Nazi. It literally would be the end of that. That would, the whole world would be different right now if, if we didn't. Oh, we would be the, salute. We irony. would be hiling Hitler right now. But that's if the, that happened, that's the irony is that the, the it, it takes building a nuclear weapon, an atomic bomb, 
to make to, peace. To make peace, but it's like, yeah. does it even do that? I don't, I don't know. No, it, it's it, one of those, it is a concepts, heavy one of those that gallows. I with. It's not even a struggle for me. It's like a gallows humor. Yeah, but this has been happening after, since the beginning of time, since when they discovered how to make, uh, 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 what, what's the, um, steel. So when, you know, it goes from iron to to steel weapons and all of a sudden that's like having the atomic bomb back then oh yeah the because, bronze age the iron now age, you have the... weapons that are, are gonna last they're better they're sharper they're ha faster they're easier to hold now you can go in and 10 guys can take on 100 guys so what you this has been happening since the beginning of time it's like the, you we see these civilizations rise up and it's like it's all centered around who can conquer who and like who has the armies? Who has the legions? Caesar's got the legions. Oh, Caesar crossed the Rubicon. Now he's got the Senate. Now he's the king. And like this is how if you if you look at history from a macro point of view and just watch it unfold, it's like a big chess game. The board is just uh, all these countries: Rome, China, uh, the, the 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 Gaelic the Gaelic tribes, the uh, the Scythians and the Persians, the Parthians, the whatever. And like as time. You you just you're watching empires grow and then fall and then another one comes up and grows and then falls and then another one comes up and then grows and then falls and then th throughout time all these like battles and, and 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 conquering each other you're seeing everything also grow at the same time as they fall you're seeing philosophy grow you see religions grow you see Christianity comes out of Judaism you see uh, you see all these things that happen with them with human civilization that are a result of cause and effect over and over and over throughout the throughout decades and centuries and millennia. And then you look back and you're like, it's all one continuous flow of like events. Yeah, it's a constant cycle with history, which is why it's just so it's like so this is why I don't worry about what's going to happen uh, in terms of our current history right now is because all one needs to do is look to the past in order to divine the future. And and it's proven Time and time again, time immemorial. Uh, actually, history is a cycle. As uh, it says in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's just nothing new under the sun. There isn't. And so, you know, we're very fortunate to have uh, such copious amounts of records that are now being suppressed in the name of God knows what. But stop it. If any of you are are playing ball with that, familiarize yourself with uncomfortable elements of history, especially Nazism, so that it can't so that one can gird themselves against these types of infectious ideas. People don't even know where the term Nazi comes from. It comes from national socialist, Nazi and socialist. Well, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. That is a good point, by the way. It's a great point. What do you think about people who blame the church for the anti-Semitism that created the nazi episode. i think that they're the lunatic fringe and that you all need to stop it's the same people that came out against the uh, you know pet passion of the christ jesus was a jew all right so what about the um what is it called the uh the the the, the trials that happened in uh spain and the inquisition oh, the spanish inquisition yeah i mean the, the, i mean they told i mean pretty much threw the jews in the, into ghettos the jews have been or they had to convert but here's the thing. Here's where this is. People talk about the Inquisition because that's so commonly everyone knows. And about they the know, Inquisition. yeah, but they don't really but, know about but it. But I think here's here's what I think really happened as far as the anti-Semitism is that Catholicism sort of made it. Um, how do you say this? It sort of made it like for people to to be bankers. It was like sort of frowned upon for a while, and so the only people who were bankers in Roman society. I'm talking on the Middle Ages, going in before the medieval times. Actually, going into medieval times because this happened with the Medi Medici family. It started the first Medici was a Jew, and there were, a lot of the bankers were Jews. A lot of the bankers were Jews for the for the first like I don't know how many couple centuries in Ro in you know Middle Ages going into medieval time. Long story short, this caused a lot of people to think that they run everything because look, there's another Jew. Oh, because they're successful and hard workers. Right. That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So well, a everyone's lot of, jealous so of what successful it, what people, you know, well, that's, that's what I'm saying. So it caused a lot of people to become anti-Semitic in the sense that they thought there was some sort of, some sort of evil hand at the black hand is behind everything. And it's the Jews. They're doing it. Yeah. See, they own the banks. They own everything. It's interesting that you refer to it as a black hand because, uh, you know, what is actually called the black hand, La Cosa Nostra, the mafia. That means the black hand. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we all glamorize the mafia, these 
butchers. Well, what, what about what about how the? I mean, did, wouldn't you, can't you say that the, the the mafia sort of borrows their structure from the church, uh, like the Potter, the the father, the Potter? Oh yeah, well you know, it's sort of like a mirror image well, of the church. Isn't that interesting though? Because Satan, the enemy, who you, you know is laughing hysterically at people who you know uh, believe that he's some type of a an allegory at best. And just, you know, some mythical equivalent of what you morons call the uh, flying spaghetti monster and all that juvenilia. It, like, but it's, it's, it's interesting because Satan all throughout scripture uh, is constantly imitating Christ. I mean, you know, the, the, the unholy trinity. The false prophet, the so, beast, and the antichrist. Yeah. Father, son, and holy spirit. Not, not wow. in that order, of course. Like... Always like Satan has to imitate the church. And I've said this a few times, but do, does anybody find it odd that the one name that is a constant curse word, uh, like multiculturally, uh, it, 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 it's 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 found in essentially every uh, culture uh, extant. As far as I know, I, it, I'll stand by that. Uh, Jesus Christ is a, a curse word. It's not. Yeah. Buddha. It's not Shiva or Krishna or Vishnu or uh, you know Z Z Zoroaster or you know it, it, it's no. It's the name of Christ, and you know why? It's because that is the name that is infused with a limitless and boundless power that at all cost he the enemy has to besmirch, whether you believe in him or not, which what? is you know only affects you. I think there's actually a title for the Pope that's like Theos Pater, which means Godfather. So I think maybe it's possible that the mafia could have been looking at that and saying, "Well, the structure of the Catholic Church is fairly miraculous. Uh, I, I, like, it, I mean, it is amazing. Uh, wh whether or not one subscribes to the tenets of the faith is is arbitrary. Uh, well, I mean, as an institution, it's breathtaking. That, do you know that that's, Constantine the Great? I mean, like, well, he, what a story. Well, Constantine, like, the church that Constantine set up, they actually transferred over from what was the Roman Imperial cult. For example, the Pontifus Maximus, which is the Pope right now, the, 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 the office of Pontifus Maximus in the Vatican literally goes back to pagan times where it was literally still called the Pontifus Maximus. Julius Caesar had that title. So did Augustus. It actually, I just learned that the other day, actually. I yeah, was watching... Ju uh, Julius Caesar technically was the Pope, mm -hmm. which is mind-blowing. But, 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 but basically, the whole point I'm bringing this up is that their institution that you're talking about that you're saying is miraculous... Which I think is also fascinating in myself. It's amazing the way it's set up. It goes back to like 800 BC. They said that's a Plutarch. Plutarch wrote, wrote that the uh, the term Pontifus Maximus is older than Rhodes. See, I did not know that. Yeah, <laughs> which is mind blowing. That is mind blowing. I'm uh, I'm and they converted from their Roman imperial called paganism to Christianity, not under Constantine. The church didn't co convert yet, but he got he definitely got the ball rolling. He made he brought Christianity into the fold. The, I would say the church would have would have would have converted like slowly between that period and Theodosius. Well, I mean, the church absorbed uh, the uh, w what what I guess we would co colloquially term as uh, or collectively rather uh, term as Vikings. Uh, they ab the Vikings were. Oh, the, the Ostrogoths. Yeah, the, the Goths, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths. Well, yeah, they invaded. Like, these people were less defeated in battle. I mean, they were King Alfred, and 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 for all you Vikings fans out there, uh, what you know, you kind of know this history. But they were more or less absorbed into the Anglo-Saxon yeah. oh, uh, yeah. uh, world. I mean, like so many of them converted and settled and and, and everything that, that, that Christendom essentially absorbed them. Well, in the in the fifth century, which is even more amazing to well, me. Yeah, well, I was going to say in fifth the, in the fifth century, <clears throat> under the reign of Justinian. I'm sorry, before we're just right before Justinian, the right before yeah, this is like fifty years before Justinian, the uh, Western Roman Empire fell to the Ostrogoths under Alaric. You know, Italy, oh, yeah. Italy the Hun. They went in and they just took over the Western Roman Empire. And instead of instead of squashing the Catholic Church and ending it forever, they just inherited it and they stepped right in. We're the Catholic Church now. We're the Western Church now. So the Western Church became 
what it was, it's sort of like, it sort of like stays like it's like a stationary uh, axiom, and then people That's come an and go. Excellent analogy. Yeah, people just come and go. And it just sits there. Even I'm talking. Even th- sorry, even, that like caught me off but, guard. But even, like, well tra- done. Even transcending religions, <laughs> like even before it was Christian, it was there. So you had this like area, this Roman city, this Vatican, that sits there and it stays there and never leaves. It's still the same thing it was thousands of years ago. I want to make a well. That's one uh, element of genius uh, embedded into it's Catholicism. A lot too, especially right now where they're it's allowing- like it's, it's like the Constitution. I mean, like there are amendments. Yeah, to the Constitution. I know what you're saying. Uh, you know that are commensurate to uh, the various technological and socio-political uh, metamorphoses in this country, which is what makes the documents sustainable. Yeah, right. S- the Catholic Church, you know, with various councils and and uh, um, edicts and uh, w- w- what have you, retains. Uh, and increases its um, its social gravitas, yeah. if you like, by allowing itself to um, amend certain key areas. Uh, you know, what, so there. I I I, I want to say before I forget to. Uh, there's a lot of abject BS written about Christians, you know, uh, and written about um, like. I'm not so familiar w- with all of the arguments about why, for instance, the movie, the film Passion of the Christ was somehow anti-Semitic, uh, but it, it's a command for Christians uh, to love and support the Jewish people. Uh, whoever blesses you, I will bless, and whoever curses you, I will curse, says the Lord. That's, you know, a, a Jesus himself, the son of the living God. Uh, was Jewish, is Jewish. Um, I don't really, and and furthermore, the history that is depicted uh, in uh, various adaptations of um, Christ's passion is what it is. Uh, he was handed over, uh, and he w- he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. But uh, you know, it was his own people that delivered him up. That history doesn't care about your feels, you know, it just doesn't. It's an immovable, implacable thing that people are trying to amend. And yes, history is to a degree is written by the uh, victors, uh, but it's also, uh, you know, written by those vanquished or thought to be vanquished. And it's a harmonization between these different accounts uh, that is unfolding and being adapted and revised, but history is history. Artifacts are artifacts. Um, It doesn't really matter if it bothers us as a culture. It is what it is. It, 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 you know, that that, that's not an anti-Semitic thing to say, like to demonize a race and a belief system of people because a certain set of actions. That's where you start getting into anti-Semitism. That it happened to be, uh, you know, Caiaphas and Annas, the high priests at the time, you know, who really spearheaded this vendetta uh, against Jesus of Nazareth. That's just historical. You people who have a problem with that need to evaluate how blessed your life is that you can sit around worrying about something like that. Well, I will and say I'm this, not though. sorry about saying that also. I just want to really put it out there. I mean, the fact that I even have to sort of like sit here right now and just be like, oh, wow, did I just go too far? I don't care, of course. Yeah, no, I, yeah, but I like, still, I mean, like, it's now inculcated into me to my great shame that I have to sit in a cesspool that is like purporting to be this bastion of freedom and is intolerant of intolerance, whatever that means. Uh, you, you know, like, that's a way of saying uh, you believe what I believe or you're going to get canceled. Like, I would consider it a badge of honor. If I got canceled for speaking about the Lord, for instance, or speaking <laughs> like uh, honestly, like I'm hoping it's like a martyrdom, modern, modern martyrdom. It is modern martyrdom. <laughs> Thank you. That's what it is. It is. I like, but I will. That's s- the truth. Yeah. No. I, what, I, what you just I, said. Very enough. well fair said. Well, I will say this though about the church. About you're talking about the amendments and how the church can adapt and change itself and 
to a I, degree. I think that's a good thing. I, I, that's the one thing that I think about the Catholic Church versus the whole Baptist evangelical world, where the evangelical wants to go back to the Stone Age or however they want to go back far. Well, define the Stone Age first. Well, I'm just, I'm just being like sarcastic. Like they, no, they, I know what you're saying. I just want, church, want you to kind of delineate it a little more. Well, I'll give you an example. Okay. The church is saying that why not have why not allow gay marriage in the church? Mm-hmm. I think that's a good thing. I think the church should be open to new things like that. Or the, or the Pope saying, hey, maybe there is aliens out there. Whatever. Let's find out. If, there, if it's true, it's true. Let's not fight science. Let's not fight the scientists that are trying to discover things. Whereas you have in the evangelical world, no, the Bible says this. The world's 6,000 years old, and we need to follow what the Bible says only. And we science is a lie, and it's all Satan's game and all that stuff. That is where it gets... That's To me, that's not even... Not even, not only is it to me that's dangerous to act like that. I think. Uh, well, I want to s- figure out exactly how I'm going to respond to this. Uh, it's a th- I know thorny a lot thing. Of Catholics that don't agree with the Pope in a lot of his things, or no, well, even, they shouldn't agree the with the Pope. Uh, you know, because I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, right now, the uh, you know the the Pope that we have in there uh, right now seems to be. Uh, Bending like a reed in the wind to any single whim, <laughs> and I'm currently getting ready to be confirmed. By the way, so I'll 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 be like praise the Lord. I'm going to be confirmed in the Catholic Church finally. When, uh, when is it? Easter. Wow. This and guy's yeah. Confirmed on Easter. Well, I, you know, like so I'm ahead of you in the Catholic world. You I'm, are. I'm ahead already of me. confirmed. <laughs> I know. Are you really? I yes. didn't know that. Oh yeah, I got confirmed in. 10th grade, I think it was. Whatever. However old. Hiding your light under a bushel. Yeah, I got. I grew up Catholic. I mean. We I want to speak to the issue about gay marriage. Yeah, let's do it. Really quick. Uh, so, um, <sighs> the Bible contains, I, I, I'm just going to level with you right now yeah. and, 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 and speak to you and speak to our audience uh, on, on a personal level. I remember uh, a very, the, so I work with a lot of um I'm blessed to work with a lot of bands that are uh, very famous, and uh, w- w- without mentioning uh, this particular person's name, I um, was asked a very uncomfortable question about 10 years ago by somebody who's now a very dear friend whose band I've worked with extensively. You all would know what this who this band is. I'm not going to get into that, but... It was like two weeks in into me getting this uh, position, and he essentially asked me if his wife was going to hell because you know she she didn't believe that Jesus Christ was was the Son of God who who who, who died for her sins. And I remember I I'll never forget this. I I remember I was sitting in the chair and everybody in the studio uh, that I was at at this time was like looking at me and he did this in front of everyone. And I remember I was like, Lord, you got to give me something to say right now. Cause I'm about to sell you out. Like Peter did, <laughs> you know, like right now it's about to happen. And instantly the following came out of my mouth. I told him, I said, you know, I hate a lot of what's written in scripture because it's not easy for me or for anyone uh, to reconcile with uh, the state of our modern society. And it's just not. And Jesus, of course, said the world will hate you because it hated me first. Uh, he, he said, uh, rejoice when those uh, w- rejoice w- w- when you're persecuted, for then you know you're about my father's work. The reason I'm bringing this up is because there are a lot of things that people cherry pick uh in their so-called christianity to in order to make it more socially palatable and why bother why bother if you can cherry pick and design your own religion uh essentially you've elevated yourself to the godhood so why not worship your own reflection at that point it's not supposed to be easy it isn't supposed to be social uh was socially palatable it's not supposed to be reconciled into this jank ass society it's just not yeah and here's the thing like we're not to hate or dismiss or expel 
people who are living uh, with belief systems or lifestyles or who are taking uh, actions. I don't care what they are. I don't care if they're drug related, uh, sexual in nature. I mean, you know, as Christians, we always tend to pick on gay people. uh, And we never, you know, realize like how many uh, Christians are like actively watching pornography right now. I mean, and kind of laughing about it. How many of, uh, you know, like how many people are, well, I'm just going to say it. How many people are whoring themselves, men and women, both, uh, out and then rationalizing, well, it's the weakness of the flesh. It's, yeah, it's the weakness of the flesh. It, like, people need to clean up their own house. And... I will say something that one of my great friends uh, said to me. It kind of shocked me. Uh, He saved my life back when I was a terrible drug user. Um, So about 11 years ago, he took me in at the time. And everything that he believes is diametrically opposed to what I believe. Uh, You know, um, I'm straight. He's gay. uh, I'm Christian. He's an atheist. But we're just like brothers and he saved my life but he said something uh to me i asked him about the gay marriage issue i was just curious and he said you know what i don't believe uh that um gay marriage should be adopted into the church and i said what you know like explain that and here's what he said he said because marriage is a fundamentally religious institution and he said for an atheist and uh, for somebody, you know, uh, who, who who's gay, he doesn't feel like uh, and, and th- this is what he said to me. He said he doesn't feel like uh, gay culture should feel the need to co-opt uh, something that is like inherently um, a religious uh, institution that was, you know, designed at its inception, you know, to be between a, a man and a woman. He that he believes that uh, that how do you put it? That he believes that um, his culture should adopt their own type of ceremonial union. And I was so shocked that he was saying this to me. I never in a million years would have thought that this would have come out of his mouth. But it gave me pause at the time for something that's like a really difficult issue for people. Uh, And I just kind of wanted to share that with the audience because of all the people who I didn't expect to say this, I certainly didn't expect, you know, my wonderful friend who's a super atheist, you know, like uh just loud and proud and 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 you know who also say about I, I i just couldn't believe that and so the reason i bring that up uh to kind of close out this thought train right now is because we as christians need to stop cherry picking our faith and we need to stop uh, making concessions to every single social whim and every single person that decides to call us hate mongers because we don't adhere uh, or don't agree, uh, you know, with a set of actions or a set of uh, suggestions. Like it's ridiculous. Nobody's stopping anybody from you know uh, w- d- living their life right now, and w- except for people that are opponents of Christians. You people are always trying to muzzle us and always trying to shut us down. Like, it's not hate mongering if somebody disagrees with a sliver of the tenets that you conduct your own lifestyle in. You're the hate monger for trying to shut us up. And it won't ever happen. Not on the watch of true believers. It just won't. We don't view this culture as anything but the cesspool that it's always been from uh, from the Babylonian days till now. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's just now we're all plugged in and we all have Twitter. Okay. But like <laughs> we're all depraved. Every last one of us. Okay. All of us are. Get over it. Stop trying to muzzle every single antithetical thought pattern. Okay. Because... Jesus, at the end of the day, it wasn't the choirs that he was preaching to. It was the prostitutes. It was the hated members of society. It was the tax collectors. It was those people because those are the people that were in need of salvation. But Jesus wasn't some hippie. 
Jesus was very, very clear with what he said. Let's and read what it says. Let's read what it says, Neil. So let's, all right, I got, this is First Timothy. So First Timothy is the book that people point to when it comes to these issues, because whoever wrote Timothy, Paul, whoever, Timothy, whoever, um, Paul's epistle to Timothy. Okay, let's say, let's say this is one of his real Paul epistles, all right? He lays it out in this particular epistle. Because, I mean, if, if it wasn't for this, we wouldn't even know what the church says because it doesn't really say anything on this matter we have the old testament but we also know that we also know that jesus when when an adulteress was being stoned to death he stood up for her. so we don't know what he would have said about homosexuality until we get to paul's epistles and then he lays it out so i'm going to read two passages that i think are the most harsh okay good uh, okay so here, here's what it says in first timothy uh 1 8 it says oh let me just pull this up so i can close to it it says, and we know what the law is good. We know that the law is good. And if anyone uses it lawfully, knowing this, that law is not laid down for a righteous one, but for a lawless one. And there's a reason why I said that. I'll get to that in a second. And unruly ones, for ungodly and sinful ones, for unholy and profane ones, for slayers of fathers and slayers of mothers, for murderers, for fornicators, for homosexuals, for slave traders, slave traders, for liars, <laughs> for perjurers, and if any other thing opposes sound teaching, according to the gospel of glory, the blessed God, which I have entrusted. And then, so basically later, every single human being on the earth, because we're all one of those things. But then here's something, a lot of people point to that verse, but they also point to this verse where it says, let women, let a woman learn in silence in all subjugation but I do not allow women to teach nor exercise authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. So this is now there's a social context to that uh, that that I want to bring sure. up uh, very quickly. Part of the reason that uh, if it was Paul uh, who who was writing that that. Let, let, let's say Paul uh, had written that particular passage is because at the time there was a contingency of pagan uh, women that were constantly coming in and disrupting. Well, you had the Pythian, the the uh, the, um, the uh, prophetess of uh, what's that place called? The um, the Delphi. Delphi. Yeah. yeah. The priestess of the Oracle of Delphi. There were always women. Yeah. The, the, the prophetesses of the pagan world were usually women. So yeah, this yeah, was a absolutely. big change. The over. seers. This was a big change. Priscilla, by the way, uh, you know, who's one of the confidants of, uh, uh, you know, Paul in the early church and who had like, you know, the gift of uh, visions, uh, you know, people always want to, you know, you I'm glad that you read that uh, because it is it's it's like one of well, the most problematic it's the it's one. not problematic. I don't think it, it, it it's difficult because yeah. it's irreconcilable with this modern uh, culture. But here's the thing: we latch onto certain buzzwords. What? Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want uh, to 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 respond to the business about yeah, yeah. Slow, women being slow silent. Down. Take your time. Women at that time, uh, w as you said, were were you know the ones that were the prophetesses. And the, were, were the ones uh, they, they had a tremendous uh, amount of power. They uh, were teachers. They were seen as authorities, and they found they looked at the doctrine of Christ as enmity, and uh, you know, uh, and so they would go in and they would actively disrupt and harangue uh, the early uh, burgeoning uh, church, uh, what we would call services. I guess Paul is directly here referencing these people right. it's a because and, and if you look deeper you know a, like christianity like women were treated like cattle back then like jesus came along and elevated women to a position like i a, actually have a scholar that jesus me, was the real i feminist. actually have a scholar that told me that paul paul was actually more of a feminist yes, than anything else. Yes, he was. This is Dr. Dennis Because McDonald's. real feminism is about equality between the sexes. Well, he thinks that Paul actually was trying to find a place for women in the church. And it sounds, what I, what I just read sounds like the opposite of that. But Dennis McDonald, who's, by the way, he's one of the leading early Christian scholars in the world. He's the one who translated the uh, the, the book, the uh, Acts of Andrew. The, the, the copy that right now is the Acts of Andrew in English was translated by Dennis McDonald. This is how in this is how much this guy knows. He's 
he's literally saying to his talent, is actually this is one of Derek's videos in Myth Vision, that he thinks that Paul was more of a women's rights activist than the people of his time in comparison to the people of his time. He was revolutionary. And so clearly was Jesus. And it's I hard just, to understand that, I but wanna, I, I also, trust him though. So I trust him. I wanna uh, uh well, so do I. And it's a bold statement that he made, and I love him for it. And because there aren't enough bold statements being made anymore. Uh, you know, it's just statements to rack up likes and retweets. And don't get me started on it. Oh, thank God I deleted my Twitter. And I I, I want to say this um, before I address the, the, the passage that you had read about the law, which is, you know, really thorny, especially now in our culture. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to say this to preface it. I am sick and tired of everyone trying to explain away uh, these passages. They're difficult and they stand counter to this society that we live in, so-called. That is the testing ground, okay? Not everything is uh, has a social context that relegates it into insignificance. Some things are timeless. And the passage that you read about the law, for instance, yeah, homosexuality is in there. So is fornication. So are liars. So is slave, so trading. Is slave trading. That's interesting. It, like basically every single like but, class of uh, like we all belong to at least one of those things. Like, what, okay, so we're all in there. But you know what's interesting is that he's they're 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 saying slave traders are sin, but then there's also laws for slaves and and Romans and like slaves you should be good to your owners. I, now, to, to to play devil's advocate, or should I say, should I play God's advocate now? Because to defend the Bible now, this is what I do when I have a guest on. I always steal a man for them. I love this. This is how I am. You're a hell of a devil's advocate, right, buddy. But, here, but, but, to, but to, play, to play God's advocate right here, I guess the way I would say is like, okay, they think slave trading is, is wicked and, and a sin. But they're saying since it's already happening anyway, we might as well make laws for this thing. You might as well just say, okay, slaves be good to your tr owners, owners be good to your slaves. And like, so it looks on the surface, like for example, when I read that passage about the women, that looks like Paul hates women. But according to sc deep scholarship, Paul compared to the other people in that time period was actually treating women better. Yeah, that's another thing that's that, that bothers me. At. It's like we judge every... Uh, well, we're Ethical in this time area, period. yeah, and we're, g God help us. Yeah. And uh, why should he? With but he does. Uh, but like we constantly do this, and we 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 hold every other era of history from from a few decades ago to centuries ago. We hold up ourselves as like this bastion of like free thought and human evolution like we are every bit as murderous and treacherous and disgusting and depraved and selfish as we ever were if not more okay G dispense with your delusions of morality it doesn't exist you're not moral I'm not moral. We have a moral code that has come, whether you like it or not, to define elements of the civilization that you live in, especially in the West. I wouldn't go so far as to say it is the defining uh, aspect of it. I would have to probably give that, uh, as Neil has often said, to the Greeks. Uh, but certainly in uh, you know uh, classical uh, Europeanism and then its expansion – to the new world for all of the problematical elements uh, of that history unfolding we are not morally superior to anything we are more depraved i would argue we are certainly less principled and it's only natural that we would come up against a rigid set of principles that runs contrary to us being able to do whatever we want to as something hateful and something uh um racist and something uh w bigoted Th those are the dumbest most meaningless words that there are uh these days it used to mean something it used to i mean like you can call anybody a racist now for anything it's like you've tagged them with some scarlet letter if they bow down and uh, accede you know and and do penance or whatever i'm not going to do that i a as i've said i would consider it to be a badge of honor if i was somehow expelled or canceled like 
from this society, which is the most flagrantly malleable thing. It's the most untrustworthy thing that you could ever... God help you if you're relying on the approval of this society. What does it say about you? It doesn't say anything good. This stuff, on the other hand, existed in... Uh, certainly, so, some of it is is... You know, we need to really take into account the uh, social implications that were, you know, going on at that time. But like, it was a different world. Yeah. It and furthermore, for all these morons and jackasses that say all this nonsense about how the Bible advocates slavery as though it invented it, slavery has existed in basically every culture that's ever been. Okay. Like, yeah, but that, it's but an account. I have, I have to say this though. Don't you think the Ten Commandments, for example? Don't you think there there's your perfect opportunity for God to say, thou shalt not own a person. I mean, don't you think slavery should be high in that? Slavery is pretty fucking a big deal. Right? I think that uh, it's very easy for us to sit around and evaluate the mind of God and sit, it, like, we're very good at one thing. As, as we're geniuses for this particular thing. We sit around and we shake our fist at God, the very fist that he allows you to have, that you then shake at him. Like, the Ten Commandments covers it all, okay? Uh, yeah, but that's coming from. I am the Lord; thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, thou shalt have no uh, graven images. Uh, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, thou shalt rest on the Sabbath. Uh, honor your father and mother. Uh, thou shalt not murder. They're also different. Uh, thou shalt. Uh, Catholics yeah. are also different. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, thou shalt not steal. Uh, uh, the, the, he, like notice how the Sabbath one all of a sudden gets taken out for the Catholic ones though. What do you mean? Which means okay, so this is a good. I'm glad you brought this up. So the the Ten Commandments, for example, you see how the Jews had this Ten Commandments that's centered around Ye Jehovah. It even has the word Yahweh in there, mm -hmm. like ten times basically throughout the whole Ten Commandments. Then you get to the cat, the, the uh, Greek, or whatever, or Latin Bibles, and all of a sudden they sh they sh they're, they're tweaking it to fit their their relative person of who was reading these now all of a sudden the sabbath's gone and it's to say i don't even know what what do they change it to they change it to something along the lines of you know rest on the seventh day or something but the Sabbath it doesn't matter the sabbath the holy day they don't care about that saturday who cares it's sunday now and then now they take the word yahweh out and change it with the lord because yahweh is not the god anymore now we have a trinity god so my point no is, yahweh well, is the lord Yes, yeah, okay, like, 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 like. The, I, I don't know where you're getting that. Well, Yahweh I, is is is, is well, the getting, God I'm the Christians it, serve. I'm getting it from the Ten Commandments. They switched the, the word from Yahweh to the Lord because now it's about Jesus and Yahweh. Is that what I'm, from, from what I'm getting at? Yeah, but so uh, the whole the whole point of what I'm saying is it was always about Jesus. I I need to stop you right there. It was always about Jesus because uh, and God said, "Let us make man in our own image." There was always a plurality there, and why was true. there a plurality? Because God inherently or, God inherently means the Trinity, and it's always meant the Trinity. Okay. and people need to pay attention to yeah, that but, because it's important. But what about if you really want to get technical? That when this was being written. We're coming out of a world where the Jews themselves were polytheists. Yeah, I they know. They had multiple gods. They had Asherah was the wife of Yahweh. El was the chief god. Yahweh was the son of God. And they had all these other gods, too. You, uh, I can't wait so, until so, you... I'm gonna, Like I said, I'm going to give you my copy of Mere Christianity to read again because C.S. Lewis brilliantly I'm sure uh, yeah, talks about this. At, yeah, but you can't write it off because what he said is, 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 is like flawless about this. Like all of this stuff was an unfolding leading up sure. to the person of Christ. He was the fulfillment of all this. So all the similarities of the dying so, and rising gods to our faith so, shouldn't shake our faith. Right, it should no, embolden I, us. I'm fine with that. And I, I totally agree with what you just said. So basically you have to say, the, okay, Elohim's plural, the word Elohim's coming from a time, it's like you're seeing these remnants of the pay, of the polytheistic Israelites into the Old Incorporated Testament. Incorporated into Right, so, now, Yahweh, so yeah. you have to now say that those remnants of the Old Testament that look like accidents are really there because it has to unfold that way to fit the Trinity. Why do I have to say that? Because that's how you get to our, make God in our image, where it used to mean one thing, but now it means this thing. I don't follow. I so, want you to kind of say so that when again. It, when it says make make man in our image, mm -hmm. I scholars and myself will point to that and say, well, that's probably a, a remnant of the, the polytheistic world of why? the Canaanites and the Israelites. Why do they say that, and why is it probably because that? that's what Elohim really means? And this is we know this because we we do archaeology. But what does Elohim actually mean? The gods. I, it means the gods. 
so, so show me another instance anywhere in the world of uh you know with a passage of the states and god said let us make and god singular said let us plural make man in our image or sh or you know and god looked at the state of the world and said shall we Less contend with it like this is another way for a bunch of godless heathens to rationalize their way out of the uh, the triune god being real like get over it you know i wanted to say this too um and this is the crux of essentially i guess this might be the most important thing that i say in this podcast we <sighs> The uh, y like arguments are always going to have counter arguments that will then have counter arguments. That, you know, that I said in the last podcast, it's the same old snake eating its own janky tail. Okay, like there comes a point where you get deafened to this. You're going to find a counter argument to anything that you want to, if you really want to. We all know that mm -hmm. on any side that you're coming at this, it is in the shrieking silences that we find the voice of Christ. That's when He speaks to us. Okay, like there comes a point where empiricism simply breaks down and this becomes an issue of faith. And sure. too many people, myself included, try to rationalize and historicize the faith too much. And one thing that but, that's where you get fundamentalists from. Yeah, well, and I agree with that. That's uh, it, and it's just like we argue about the age of the earth. Like, it, it, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say anything about the age of the earth. People extrapolate a bunch of stuff about that, but like the like, my God can w do anything. I'm inclined to believe that the Earth is you know several billion years old. Yeah. Uh, I it, it was never my you know I'm inclined to believe that Genesis is not depicting like an actual tree or an actual well, garden happened. that it's you know describing an by, impossible by to way, describe you know like person, situation. By the way, the person that actually came up with that date of 4004 BC was a Catholic theologian, and all he did was simply take all the ages of people. So you in the genealogy of Luke or or Matt or Luke or Matthew is a genealogy. Those genealogies have names, and then the names you can go to the Bible and you can actually look. This person was. 40 years old when he had his son and the son was 20 years old and he had his uh, like i'm just giving random numbers out there so you can take all those numbers and put them on a piece of paper and you can make a you can actually do it you can actually date yourself all the way to the flood which is in 2800 bc which is crazy because we know what was happening in that time period now whatever i'm not gonna i don't want to harp you on that too much but that's what I'm, that's why people point to the the uh young earth thing that's why you have fundamentalist christians who have to know they think that the word is literally true like it literally means exactly what it says whereas now the catholic church has a different stance on it where they're, they're saying it's more allegorical it's not literally true like william lane craig says at the adam and eve probably didn't live in 4004 bc it probably it says this is not this is a uh, mytho history he calls it I, I i respect that you i think that's more of a better approach than to say that literally there was in 2800 bc the, the world was flooded and 20 or eight people got to the population of 20 million within a century people uh need to understand that all of these things are unimportant in the I face agree. of what is truly important about the bible here's what's important Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and God himself. He came down to die for our sins because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the, the, Christ, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So through, you know, like we, are, we should have to pay uh, for all of the evil that we all perpetrate whether we you know again delusions of morality to think that we're good people like spend some time in a drought you know maybe five days without water if you can even make it that far and you'll slit your own mother's throat to get it okay we are this far from the jungle like we or from 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 the plains uh you know in or or the desert you know places where sheer animal brutality exists and we we just pat ourselves on the back so hard about it because we live in an age of plenty and we don't have to worry about this like i need to emphasize that christians get way too hung up on a bunch of superfluous details the only thing that matters is jesus christ in christianity that like that's what it's about the Bible is an unfolding leading up to the person of Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection to save you and me and everyone. 
That's what Christianity is about. Getting hung up about the age of the earth, getting hung up about, you know, like uh, surface level contradictions between accounts is missing the point. It's the work of the enemy. It distracts and incapacitates Christians. I've seen it all my life. I myself have been fallen victim to it. You know, with this business about evolution versus creationism. Like, I don't even really know what I believe about any of that at, at, at this point because my mind is being taken in other directions. I think that I'm what a person – I think I'm – at this point, maybe inclined towards theistic evolution, but I'm always in flux about these things. Sure. The point is, none I of agree. it matters. Yeah, no, I, 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 you know, I respect and, that. I'm not even going to... Oh, you gonna... respect it, but, like, other Christians w have already assigned me a position in, like, you know, the ninth ring of hell yeah, of for course. believing this. I don't oh, care yeah, well, what y'all think and, about that. Like, Christ I, saved me, and that's the end of it, and this you is can the, go. This is the last thing I'm going to say about this, and we can talk about my brother before we close out. Because we're already at hour twenty minutes in, dude. so so but but, but just uh, just the last thing I want to say about okay. that, I, I want to let you respond to this. Okay. And the reason why fundamentalist Christians are in a corner mm -hmm. that they have to say the world's six thousand years old, that they have to say that Noah lived in two thousand eight hundred BC, that they have to do all this stuff, is because they will say, and this is my old church. This is why I left, by the way. Honestly, if I didn't go to this fundamentalist church, I probably might still be a Christian. And this is a reason why. It's a huge, big reason. I want you to respond to this. Because I think you probably have a good answer for this. But here it is. If Adam and Eve did not really live in 6,000 years ago, like the Bible says, and if, it, if this is all allegory, if this is all sort of mytho-history, like William Lane Craig says, then why do we need salvation for our sins if sin never entered the world through Adam, if this is not literally true? Oh, because uh, Adam and Eve are, are uh, in that view... Uh, that you've just described would be taken to be representative of how sin entered the world okay. that adam or eve are you know two distinct and real people or if they are representing something that is like beyond our comprehension and it's like a form of it's like a way of god to like condescend to us not in the pejorative sense but in the sense that you would talk to a child uh to illustrate something the, like so you, the point of that is scripture, how you think it's the scripture that's divinely inspired not the events yeah absolutely ah okay i respect that that's a good answer well i don't think that that's novel i think that that's how it should be read yeah <laughs> and so by the way does the catholic church this is one thing that i love about the catholic church is that like i've kind of you know th th thought that if, if i don't you know believe every you know single thing you know happened as it was written uh for the most part that there's something wrong with my faith you know i spent many years believing that bs and it's just simply not true i believe that a lot of these things are um you could almost especially in like the book of ezekiel now granted like the style of writing is apocalyptic prophecy and that's a, a, its own literary form we need to take into account the literary formats that these things were written in as well true, true. Uh, uh, uh there's a variety of things the bible is an infinitely chasmic you know if is that even a word chasm like a chasmic. deep yeah it is now uh you know like <laughs> it's an a you know it's i was gonna say abyss but that's also pejorative like it's oceanic yeah there we go and in, in its breadth in its scope and on the variety of like simultaneous levels that it functions uh in the reason that i say that is this we need to uh understand uh what is being illustrated by the telling of um these accounts and in certain instances i mentioned ezekiel uh because there are certain of these authors that you could tell that you can almost feel the sweat dripping on the page as they're writing because they're trying so desperately to corral like revelation that yeah like so de especially like the, the prophetic books like when these men had visions uh, that they're trying to describe the one in Ezekiel is my favorite book of the Bible because it's 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 like reading a kaleidoscope and it's 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 breathtaking and and but you could tell that this guy was like desperately trying to reconcile into words that others would understand something that is completely and totally alien and incomprehensible cosmic horror uh, the same that H.P. Lovecraft uh, sort of wrote about I mean not the same. Uh, on the surface certainly but like dealing with things cosmic and beyond comprehension see how i brought it full circle yeah like that that we're back to hp lovecraft again <laughs> that was beautiful like, I, love I just it. closed the, uh, the circle but that's important like you can tell 
that they were like using allegorical stand-ins in 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 some instances as uh they were using uh analogous devices and or, or analogs rather uh to as stand-ins for concepts that they didn't have any ability to describe verbatim because how could you and what kind of god is it worth worshiping if you could possibly describe or or even like divine or comprehend him it, you know we try to comprehend the mind of god so much like why am i worshiping him if i can comprehend him now people will say that that's some kind of a philosophical uh cheat if you like that i'm trying to like rationalize my way out of it no it isn't it's 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 humility that was like finally gifted to me the more i ran up against trying to reconcile everything and trying to rationalize every miracle like things are miraculous when they exist outside of natural occurrence so stop trying to explain them away. Stop trying to explain or account for, well, the year that this probably happened. And if I do this math and I move this integer over here, that's not the point. I mean, these authors were writing about things beyond our world for our world. And the language that you use is not one alien. You use a language that is human and things that we can understand to illustrate things beyond our comprehension. So these writers are very clearly attempting to describe uh, otherworldly, incomprehensible events and phenomena in a language and with descriptors that humans can recognize. Uh, I tend to think that that it, um, my own reading of the Genesis account uh I guess would be an example of that. Do I believe personally that it was uh, an actual tree with actual fruit, you know, that would divine the knowledge of uh, good and evil? I personally don't. I personally uh, b believe that uh, those things are stand ins for other more alien, not alien in the sense that, you know, l little green men, but uh, alien as in foreign to our understanding. Right. Uh, that those things are ways for these authors to describe the emergence of sin into our dimension. Uh, j just as an example, certainly the works uh, of the prophets uh, and their visions are filled with uh, allegorical uh, terminology. Uh, I do believe that they were uh, seeing those things. Uh, I, I I believe that there's a very specific reason why, you know, the uh, Daniel's prophetic visions uh, had to do with uh, four beasts, uh, you know, with multiple heads and talking horns and all of this, I, because that's how the prophetic events were represented to him. I mean, w my favorite account is, you know, when the angel comes to speak to him to interpret the visions the visions had to be interpreted, unlocked, if you will. And so they had to be unlocked because they're so heavily metaphorical. I definitely believe that the prophets were seeing those things, though. Uh, uh, in, in the book of Revelation, uh, same thing. And so I think people need to stop getting hung up on the um, literal nature or uh, unliteral and allegorical nature of these things. I think we need to do our best to understand uh as best we can the context uh that these things were written in what do i mean by context i really mean the literary style that things are, are written in and what exactly these people are describing but most importantly why and i don't think that that uh it, it, I, anyone who presumes to say that my faith is lacking because this is my view uh is you know, attempting to be dictatorial to, to me. It has nothing to do with the fervency of my faith. The fervency of my faith has to do with one thing. It's what I believe about Jesus Christ. I believe he's the son of the living God who came uh, to die for my sins so that I could achieve salvation and so that each of you and all of us as a race of beings uh, could achieve salvation. And that's Christianity right there. What you believe about Jesus Christ, that's what defines you as a Christian, not the age of the earth, not what the prophets meant, not whether revelations already happened or hasn't already happened. All fascinating topics in their own right, uh, but all inconsequential in terms of one's salvation and the destination of their soul in the afterlife. 
Yeah, I, I respect that. I, I think that was a good interpretation, and I think it's pretty. It's strong. It's and uh, it's, you're it's, damn right. It's strong. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, we had so many more things we wanted to talk about, but we just this is how we always are when we get together. Yeah, we just have these. We can't help it. Yeah, so we're gonna come. Do I want to get you back in here sooner than the last time than than months? Let's do weeks this okay time. sure and let's 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 do this let's open this conversation up let's see what the chat has to say in the comments oh i can't wait yeah I, like i can only imagine but uh once again i want to thank uh everyone who's watching this uh like i said um the last time that i uh spoke up uh everyone was extremely gracious uh to me uh especially people with completely antithetical viewpoints um i thank you for uh that graciousness um I we've spoken about a lot of issues that are now, you know, deemed to be essentially off limits, but uh, hopefully we've done that in a loving way. Um, look, the Bible is a difficult book by its own nature. Uh, and uh, I wish that the Bible said a lot of things that it just simply doesn't say. But what I wish about it doesn't really matter. It, it's what it does say and what it doesn't say. Um, Fair enough. you know, so don't shoot the messenger or if you do whatever, okay, <laughs> I'll take the bullet. Uh, but anyway, uh, all joking aside, thanks so much, Neil. I love you to pieces, uh, to any friends of mine that might be watching. I love you too. Praying for you, praying for each and every one of you watching as well. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. <gasps> The Demiurge has no power over you. Jeez.